Hello, and welcome to episode number 39 of the Point of Convergence podcast. As always, I am your host, Exoacademian. If one thing is clear as we look back over the course of 38 episodes of the Point of Convergence podcast, it's that the so-called UFO phenomenon is as complex and multifaceted as it is equal parts bewildering and fascinating. As I've mentioned numerous times before, while there is a temptation to reduce this complexity by making all of the anomalous phenomena observed and experienced about a single intelligence parading in a variety of different ways, I just don't think this notion fits the data well when we look at it honestly and completely. Rather, to me, when one considers the breadth and depth of the data gathered over the last century, and perhaps going back into the depth of human lore, it seems apparent that numerous non-human intelligences are appearing and interacting with us. And truth be told, the ways these various intelligences manifest before our eyes, interact, manipulate, and sometimes control us, is just as varied as the plethora of supposed alien species described within the literature of the UFO phenomenon. Some of these entities appear like what we might call solid biological beings, with one assumes beating hearts and liquid blood of one color or another pulsing through their veins. Other intelligences seem to be better described as either post-biological or simply non-biological and seem most often to manifest in forms made purely of light. When one considers the fullness of the data gathered, it is also clear that some entities seem, from a moral point of view, perhaps no more sophisticated than us, and demonstrate, if not malevolent, then at least self-serving behaviors. And as we discussed last week, sometimes the actions of some of these others are best described as representing a kind of symbiotic relationship with human beings, where both sides of the equation, us and them, gain something from the encounters. Then there are beings like those encountered in the case we're going to discuss today, the case of Israeli experiencer Yossi Ronin, who seemed to demonstrate not just a moral superiority when compared to us, but also what one might describe as a moral innocence, as if their evolution didn't progress from self-serving to cosmocentric, so much so as the nature of their experience of reality always revealed to them, from the beginning, the interconnectedness of all that is, so that from their point of view, harming another would be no different than harming oneself. Yossi Ronin's encounters with these beings was as life-altering as it was short and to the point. While the time spent in their presence was but a blink of the eye in comparison with the totality of the days of his life thus far, the impact for Ronin was as incontrovertible as it was irreversible. Never again would he be able to see reality the same way following his encounter. For he learned not just about a kind of intelligence beyond human, but a fundamental truth about the nature of reality itself revealing a non-dual, interconnected totality best described in the term oneness. Yossi Ronin's life-changing encounters with interdimensional aliens and the revelations regarding the nature of ultimate reality that emerged as a result are the topic of this, the 39th episode of the Point of Convergence podcast. I'd like to begin this week's episode by describing Yossi Ronin's process when it came to putting together his book that describes his encounters and the way they changed his life. His book is titled One, Face-to-Face -face Contact, Experiencing ET Consciousness and Human Consciousness Evolution. An excellent book. I highly recommend it. Now, in this first section, the introduction, he talks about just how difficult it was to process all of these events and then put pen to paper so as to describe them to other people. This is what he writes, quote, The first part of this book covers my testimony concerning my face-to-face -face encounter and direct communication with several extraterrestrials, intelligent beings whom I refer to as the visitors. This encounter occurred in 1981 when I lived in L.A. for about one year. 
the very appearance of these beings that stood before me was a complete contradiction to anything I had ever known about everyday reality as I recognize it. Following this encounter, at the young age of 21 years old, the course of my entire life has changed, and since that day, the meaning of this experience has become an integral part of my life. After many testimonials we have heard from other experiencers who have also met with the visitors, we know now that the visitors' communication with us goes straight into our consciousness. In my case, the communication had another aspect to it. The contact showed itself to me in two different states of my consciousness, one as part of an out-of-body experience and the other when I was awake and fully conscious in front of them, face to face. To this day, I cannot clearly say whether the visitors planned to communicate with me in both ways or if it was unexpected. In any case, meeting and interacting with the visitors in both states allowed me to understand more about the consciousness aspects in which this very different but not separate ways of communication occurs between us. Unquote. Now, I just want to stop for a second and touch on what he just described there. This is very interesting, very compelling, and I haven't seen this happen in many other cases, and yet it makes sense that it could happen. What we have in Yossi Ronin's case is the visitors, as he calls them, revealing themselves to him both in a dreamlike out-of-body experience as well as in his waking state. In fact, as you're about to find out, what was incredibly startling and discombobulating to him was that he had a dream, which he thought was interesting, wondrous in some ways, certainly fascinating. But then to his shock, he woke up to find these same beings who he had just experienced in a dream now interacting with him in the everyday 3D waking world. But before we get to that, I just want to touch a bit more on how difficult it was for him to write this book, to put pen to paper and make sense of these encounters. Quote, composing this book has taken many years. It was difficult at first to come to terms with the actual encounter or even to discuss it. Then to comprehend the complexity of the experience, I had to translate the nonverbal communication into spoken language and rational terms and phrases. And at last, the repeated self-examination I did for my understanding and interpretation. The visitors have a different perception of reality compared to our own. I had to attempt and grasp their mode of thinking. Sharing the visitors' consciousness during my contact with them allowed me briefly to experience the way they see us and their understanding of us. In this book, I summarize my perspective of my encounter and its implications. Hopefully, this writing will assist us all in our joint endeavor to better understand this new reality we are currently facing, having realized that we are not alone. Unquote. Now, in just a moment, we'll get to the actual encounter itself that completely startles and bewilders and eventually changes the life of Yossi Ronin, again, only after turning it upside down. But first, I want to touch on something he wrote about there. And that is the challenging process of trying to translate something like telepathic communication into written language that we can read in a linear fashion as we're accustomed to do. The challenge is that for people who experience these others, some of them anyway, as well as interestingly those who have a near-death experience, often they return and say that the experience was not just about an expression of thought given to the mind from the mind of another, but more than that, it's more a multidimensional kind of experiencing of the other's presence, where you sense both their emotions and their thoughts. The full totality of who they are and what's going on for them is available to you. Sometimes this happens between one being and another, where they're both made aware of each other's total experience in the moment, thought and emotion. And sometimes it happens between, for instance, one human being and a group of entities. So again, you can imagine the challenge and how much you'd have to truncate the experience, reduce it into something much more limited when you take that profound multidimensional kind of experience and translate it into linear step-by-step -step thought. 
Okay, without further ado, let's get to his initial encounter and how mind-blowing it truly was. Just to remind you, this begins in a dreamlike experience and later becomes much more than that. Quoting from the book, quote, It happened on the evening of a sunny day. My brother and I came home to rest after a long working day. My brother was sleeping in his room and I was dozing off, facing the wall beside my bed. After a few moments, I shut my eyes and for the first time in my life, found myself within a dream that was taking place outside my body, in that very room. In my dream, I knew I was outside my body, which was sleeping in bed. I didn't have an actual body, but it was perhaps something akin to a child's small body, transparent without any definite outlines. I felt happy being close to the bed, hovering over it, then sitting at the nearby table, looking around, at peace, fully conscious and aware of what was going on. I was smiling whilst looking, watching at my sleeping body. The sensation of the distance from my body felt pleasant, liberating, free, and light. It was a good feeling. I was seeing, sensing, smelling, and hearing everything that was going on around me without the familiar boundaries of my body. My brother was sound asleep in the next room, on the other side of the wall, breathing calmly. And then I saw them. They were in a room as well. They were not quite human. Little entities between the armchair and the couch by the TV. One of them was standing by my sleeping body, watching it. Amused, I looked at them, watched them wobble along in a funny, clumsy way across the room from one spot to another. They were looking around the apartment with such curiosity and wonder. One of them picked up a piece of paper very carefully, as though seeing it for the first time. He touched it and felt it, clasped his fingers around it, listening for the sound of the crumpling paper, smelled it. They looked similar to human children in a new playground. I felt I knew them like they were childhood friends of mine. They were a little under four feet, three inches tall. Their heads were slightly bigger than ours. I do not recall how many fingers they had. I think I saw five in each hand, longer than our own, gentle and supple. One of the guests was chubby, his belly protruding over his scrawny legs. His walk was also clumsier than that of the others. Another was so skinny I could see the outline of his bones right under his skin. I was watching them calmly and blissfully. We were all rejoicing together. One of them was moving back and forth across the mat, wobbling like a duck, marveling and laughing like a child taking his very first steps." Unquote. So let me reflect on what I just read. Clearly Ronan is having a dream-like experience, but it is not your typical dream. He's having what is called an out-of-body experience. He's able to look down at his bed and see his normal human body lying there fast asleep, while also experiencing being in a more subtle form of a body outside of that body. And while he's in this state, feeling playful and blissful as he describes, he sees these other entities who are in a state that he can see when he's in this out-of-body state. And they are looking around the apartment, behaving almost like children, fascinated with this new playground of sorts. Now, I touched on it just a moment ago in what I read. And in this next section, you'll see it mentioned again. This sense of familiarity with these beings, even though right now he thinks he's seeing them for the first time, we later find that time also has a very peculiar way of manifesting when he's in these altered states. It's very complex, very fascinating, and we'll get to that. But first, let's now turn to the point where he wakes up and finds something quite startling. Quoting from the book again, quote, Upon awakening, I was still smiling, recalling the weird dream. I wondered about this unfamiliar expanse my imagination had brought forth, complete with such a palpable dream, which was so strange and wild. Suddenly, I heard these strange sounds coming from inside the room I was in, like bare feet making rapid steps across the carpet. I rubbed my eye, still in bed, facing the wall. There was a rustle of things being moved about, crumpling paper, strange whispers. My smile was gone, my heart pounding. 
Did thieves break into our house? Are they trying to keep quiet so I don't wake up? I remembered I had locked the door from the inside. Impossible. No one could possibly have gotten in. Turning around to face the room, I felt an electric shock hit me hard and I began to tremble helplessly. Right across from me, less than two feet away, stood one of the visitors from the dream I just had. He was staring right at me. Four or five others were standing right behind him. His huge eyes looked deep into me. They were black and shiny, like pupils that had grown to a huge size. I felt small, as if he was observing me under a microscope. Then I felt a terrible fear. It was strong and unfamiliar. Curling up, I gasped. My breath stopped. I tried to digest the fact that I was looking at the same visitors that I had just seen in my dream. What was I seeing? Is this still the dream or did I wake up? I shook my head, pinched my hand, and the pain made me realize I was awake. Am I out of my mind? What's going on? What's happening to me? The visitor's gaze went right through me with such force, such an immense, paralyzing effect. Fear was rapidly surging within me. My muscles contracted so hard. I couldn't move. Something strange and out of this world, scary, is invading my insides now. It felt so frightening to be under someone else's control. Another person who dominated me, who could have me act however he pleased. I felt this danger as if I had only a few more moments before I would be taken up by something so much bigger than me. It was like he was about to swallow me. They are not of this world. That much was obvious to me. Their curious bodies had these bright green and orange rust-colored patches. Their skin had grooves, and yet it was gentle and soft, hairless. In relation to their small bodies, their heads were big and their eyes were black, elliptical, with no eyelids. They were so big that they took up most of their face. They had two tiny slits for a nose, a very narrow groove for a mouth, no lips, and a small chin. The sight of them before my very eyes was so shocking. It felt like my own end, like ceasing to be, like death. My guest wasn't speaking to me, but something inside me knew he was seeing and experiencing everything I was feeling and thinking, like I was an open book to him. In my paralysis, I saw my own fear and helplessness reflected through his black, shiny eyes." Unquote. Now, before we continue with this mind-boggling experience that Ronan is having, let's first reflect on the fact that, on the one hand, when we have these kind of experiences in a dreamlike state, where perhaps our normal alarm system, you might call it, is offline, we don't respond in a startled way. We don't experience fear so much. And yet, in our waking state, where we have a certain understanding of the way reality is supposed to unfold, when we have a similar kind of experience, or in Ronan's case, the very same experience where the same beings he was just encountering in an out-of-body but dreamlike state suddenly manifest in the 3D plus one waking world, he is gripped with fear. Better said, terror. That's what his response is. Again, we've talked about this before. This is kind of the evolutionary response, the fight or flight response that human beings put forth when we encounter something so unknown. And now let's continue with that section from the book where he is not only experiencing these others in a waking state, but processing how different the experience is once he is in that waking state. Quoting from the book again, quote, I recall the pleasant dream I just woke up from. It's them. They were really there. So what was happening? It wasn't really a dream. A short while ago, I knew them and it was all fine without this fear. For one brief moment, I was able to stop this trembling all over, this terrible fear for my life. With my very last ounce of strength in my desperation, and perhaps because I had no other choice, I tried to look beyond my fear, to regard them as something else other than what I saw. In some hopeful attitude, unrelated to my own body, still petrified and anxious, I was looking into his eyes, searching for that love I remembered from the dream. 
The pain from the sound of the drilling that I kept hearing, as though it was forcing its way right through me all this time, began slowing down. As it adjusted its pace, it began to sound different, clearer, more intelligible. Are these their thoughts, their emotions? The noise slowly diminished, and I began noticing more sensations, more thoughts. Is this their communication that I'm hearing? Is this what I am sensing? And it was at this precise moment that I began experiencing them with my own consciousness. All at once, the full awareness of one of the beings before me flowed into me, and through him, via him, that of all the others too. The sight of their faces did not change, but everything the guests were thinking or sensing passed on to me too, and was now inside me, expanding, as if it were my own consciousness. Their thoughts did not consist of definite words. Rather, this was a wide expanse, a multifaceted flow of consciousness that had the feeling of an enormously huge event. They were experiencing a simple peace I was not familiar with. It had no sense of superiority, as one would expect given their formidable power. The guest's consciousness was like an open book to me. I felt them completely, pleasant, still, lucid, and clear. Their thoughts and emotions seemed harmonious, unified, unseparated. I encountered their love and acceptance towards me as well, and not thanks to anything about me. Likewise, they simply accepted themselves and each other unconditionally, endlessly. They were transparent, upfront, and self-conscious, as well as toward one another, without any need to hide, play act, repress, or be anything else other than what they were precisely at that moment. I felt they loved themselves and accepted themselves at face value, without any judgment, good or bad. And that was the same way they treated whatever was around them, their own kind, any human beings, or anything else whatsoever. Unquote. Now, before we move on to the part of the book where Ronan then has to ground this experience in his everyday life and make sense of what this means in terms of how he understands reality differently, let's first again reflect on what we just read. Once again, we had the element of the telepathy being much more than just a piece by piece sharing of information like linear thought. He experiences them in their totality, and at first he feels immensely naked and vulnerable in front of them because he recognizes he is also an open book to them. But as time goes on, he begins to recognize this is just the nature of existence for them. This is the normal mode of existence. And he realizes they have a very childlike, innocent way of experiencing themselves and other beings, including human beings, including himself. As I mentioned in the introduction, this experience for Ronin was about much more than just realizing non-human intelligences existed and could actually interact with us. His experience with these others actually was much more profound and life-altering than that. His entire perspective changed because he began to recognize, once he'd been in that mode of thought, that everything was connected in the cosmos, not just one conscious entity to another, but even various aspects of nature as well. And now I'd like to read from a section of the book where he talks about how different his understanding of reality was now, even in the everyday world, walking around in nature. Quoting from the book again, quote, In my regular state, every object around me seems separate from the other. The tree is distinct apart from the ground, and likewise air, sun, and so on. But now, as some resonance to the experience of sharing all my different senses jointly, I was seeing the same connection that had always been there, all around. Now the trees are a clear continuation of the ground below, and of the sun and the air above, without any intermission or pause between any of them, like one continuous body. The trees were nourished by the earth. The food and the water that nourished it flowed through the trees as well. So they were, in fact, a direct continuation of the ground. Sunlight descended and permeated the leaves, merged with the water, and became part of the plant. The tree was also the condensation of the sunlight. 
light flowed through the leaves downwards, descending right into the heart of the earth, along with the roots and making it fertile. One complete cycle of life traveled from the ground below to the sun above and back down again. Sunlight met the earth and the water in each leaf where they connected as though making love with one another. Fire and water converged into one, giving life in the process. I looked at the tree leaves right in front of me. Then I went deeper into the feeling of sensation of the leaves at the top of the tree, which faced upwards to the blue sky. And for the first time ever, noticed something else. The tree was conscious and in a deep, continuing state of thankfulness for its existence and for the light he was receiving." Unquote. Now, in a moment, we're going to discuss what happens when Ronan tries to share this experience with others. As you might expect, it leaves something to be desired. But first, I want to touch on something Jacques Vallée and other researchers have talked about, and that is the psychic component or the way that human beings are profoundly changed, transformed by experiences with the UFO phenomenon. Again, when we use that term, the UFO phenomenon, I believe it actually encompasses multiple entities, different species and whatnot. But here we're clearly seeing a human being being profoundly changed, transformed by an experience with these others. And like Valet noted, as well as groups like Free with the book Beyond UFOs, people are often transformed in positive ways for the long term. It's not like they just have a temporary change of perspective, like someone who's been on an acid trip or something. No, they are changed profoundly for the long run. For as long as we've actually been able to study them and ask ongoing questions about the way they see reality, this continues, that once and for all, their perspective is changed. And this is one of the most profound and telling aspects of the UFO phenomenon. Now, of course, when someone goes through something as life-changing as this experience, of course they want to be able to share it. No human being can very easily ground an experience, make sense of it, if they don't have the chance, the opportunity to share it with others, especially people close to them. Of course, as we know, often this doesn't go so well because others don't want to have their notion of reality challenged. And that's exactly, of course, what this kind of experience does. How else can you make sense of it? Well, not unlike others, Ronan gets to the point where he wants to share his experience with his mother. This is what happens. Quoting from the book again, quote, No longer could I escape the notion that I had to share my experience. It was necessary to talk about it. The first person I told about it was my mother the person I knew loved me and accepted me more than anyone else. When I told her about the encounter, I saw the anguish and pity in her loving eyes. As much as she tried to listen without responding, I could tell by how she tilted her head that she wanted to hide her tears. I waited for her to tell me on her own volition what she felt about it. The next day, she seemed anxious and upset. When I asked her about how she felt about what I had told her, she said she was concerned about me and feared that I was doing drugs while I was in the States and that they must have clouded my mind. This is but one of many reactions I began getting from those I shared my encounter with. Only a few immediately realized what I was talking about and their eyes lit up, unquote. Now, one of the reasons I find this book so compelling, Yossi Ronin's book One, and again, I highly recommend you read it, is that he touches on the so-called contact modalities. I don't think he uses that term, but he, he touches on the notion by comparing experiences like a meeting with the visitors or the others, whatever you want to call them, apparent non-human intelligences or aliens, as well as experiences like out-of-body experiences or near-death experiences. And we've talked about this numerous times on this podcast. This is the points of convergence I've been talking about all along. And he really does address this in the book. And he comes to some of the same conclusions, recognizing that all of these experiences are pointing to something fundamental about reality, where perhaps consciousness is primary and things like matter and energy are derivatives. And I want to now quote from a section of the book where he makes some very interesting 
leaps in understanding by applying the revelations of quantum physics and how that might apply in a situation like an experience with the others or a near-death experience. Quoting from the book, quote, Niels Bohr is quoted as saying, Everything in reality we call real is made of things we can't say are real. It is difficult for us to digest this sentence because it does not make sense. But perhaps the way to understand it is to accept that there is a layer in our reality that is not real nor made for our ordinary perception. My hypothesis is that quantum reality is in fact a glimpse of another dimension, possibly the ability of today's scientific world to prove the existence of that quantum world is only the discovery of the tip of the iceberg of the vast space in that dimension. The new revelations showing that these particles respond to the observer's consciousness give us a hint that there is a connection between our consciousness and that dimension of subatomic particles. So, in a way, it is the same dimension. We can see the connection between the two different modes of these particles, a wave or a particle, and the experience of our consciousness in its two basic modes, the normal state and its different awareness in clinical death. When consciousness is not limited to the body and its senses, it experiences the same layer, another dimension, that does not seem real to our everyday knowledge. During the clinical death experience and on the other side of the tunnel, the time and space experience of our cognition are different. They are boundless and not defined, a situation similar to a superposition. After awakening from the experience, the perception of reality returns to its usual place, and we are forced to translate and materialize the memory of the experience. This defines and limits it to a form, to a particular thing in time and place. This perception is similar to the situation of position. After the measurement by our ordinary consciousness, the experience of all possibilities beyond the tunnel is forced to collapse into our familiar, definite option. Unquote. Now again, as I mentioned in the introduction, it took Ronin many years to ground this experience, to make sense of it, and then to begin to describe it, share it in a way that others could make sense of. In conclusion, this is what he says about his experience and many experiences of this kind that people have. And again, in drawing these conclusions, Ronan talks about both experiences with the others as well as experiences like near-death experiences because he sees a lot of common ground. Quoting from the book again, quote, It is hard for us to logically accept such a different reality, to grasp a reality where our familiar definitions and boundaries do not exist. However, the very fact that at least some of us remember the experience on the other side of the tunnel indicates that we have the ability to experience and tap into that dimension. Just because each of us remembers and translates an indefinite entity in a particular and different way from one another does not negate the very essence of that being as he saw it. This is something we can understand only by experiencing it. In the space beyond the other side of the tunnel, all the various possibilities exist together as one. People who have encounters with visitors encounter the same phenomenon as the tunnel experience. In this instance too, the ET's appearance as part of the meeting with a human being cannot escape being translated by the person who meets them into the form his or her mind assigns. This is the way the mind grasps processes, and stores the information, unquote. Now, there is a lot to chew on in that quote. Number one, he's touching on the quantum physics aspect, suggesting that like superposition versus position with quantum mechanics, that in that altered state of consciousness, that alternate realm that people experience both when they're encountering the others, some of them anyway, as well as in experiences like near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences, you have a much more multifaceted experience. And therefore, whether you're Yossi Ronin encountering alien beings, or you're one of his relatives who's had a near-death experience, or you're someone like Ibn Alexander 
a brain surgeon who has talked and written extensively about the nature of near-death experiences of which he had one. When you return to the 3D plus one waking existence that we call reality, you inevitably lose aspects of that beyondness. Elements are lost in translation by default, not only because we now have to translate it into a kind of a linear experience of reality where time is fixed and only moves in one direction, but we also have to use language, words that are also built around that same limited linear understanding of how reality works. And of course, that helps explain why people who have had these experiences wrestle and are frustrated with the inability to really articulate the depth and breadth of the experience. Now, again, this is a great book. I highly recommend you read it. I think this is one of the most compelling cases we've come across. What's interesting is Yossi Ronan had encounters with beings he saw as extremely loving, unconditionally loving, and unconditionally available. And yet he sees his experience as being akin to something like what Whitley Strieber went through. In fact, he had an experience when he was in Tel Aviv of seeing the front cover of Communion and in fact recognizing that creature. Like thousands of people all around the world, they saw that cover and immediately recognized that as being part of their own experience. Now, some may be initially surprised by that comparison, surprised that someone like Yossi Ronin recognized that creature on the front cover of Communion and saw it as the same being, basically, as he encountered. Now, first point, as Ronin points out in the book, how we perceive these others is partly determined by us, probably partly a cultural filter, and there's some evidence of that even in cross-cultural studies, and also our own personal background. Furthermore, as we've discussed multiple times on this podcast, what we bring to the table, what we prime these events with, whether consciously or unconsciously, it's not necessarily our fault if we prime it with negative things, because much of that may be coming from the territory of our subconscious, much of which, perhaps most of which, we're not even aware of. The last thing I'd like to leave you with is the realization that for people like Yossi Ronin, or even for someone like Whitley Strieber, who initially had encounters that were full of terror, both of these figures went on to see the experiences with these others as a net positive that produced powerful, transformative, long-lasting effects in their lives. That just because fear is part of the encounters, especially initially, this does not mean these can ultimately be powerfully positive, transformative encounters. And on that note, we've come to the close of another edition of the Point of Convergence podcast. As I like to say, let's keep this conversation going and growing. But until next time, friends, from deep within the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, this is Exoacadamian signing out.